Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for, for being here today and welcome to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, this is um, the annual meeting of the International Dose Response Society and um, it's our 15th uh, meeting that we've had. I'd like to just briefly share with you some, some highlights um, uh, and, and how we got to here in, in the first place actually. Uh, as you know, this, this meeting is dealing with um, preconditioning and the upregulation of adaptive responses to protect against various types of insults that uh, biological organisms, including humans, will, will experience. And it's 2016, and uh, for those who have been in the field for a long time, uh, this is the 30th anniversary of the discovery of preconditioning, which was in 1986. And just to let you know, there is a um, kind of a celebration of that discovery in a subsequent meeting to this one in Barcelona in May, where uh, Dr. Jennings and, and others who participated in that uh, initial very exciting discovery will, will congregate and, uh, and celebrate the moment. And so I um, just wanted you to be aware of that. But so that's 30 years ago. And, and but actually, 2016 is, is actually the, the 50th anniversary of how I got involved in this hormesis uh, quest. And, and that was in, in 1966. I was actually a junior in college, and I was taking a plant physiology course. And we discovered that a low dose of an inhibitory, um, actually a synthetic plant growth retardant, stimulated the growth of peppermint plants and um, was totally unexpected and as it turns out um, um, I went back and tried to figure out why there was this uh, this low dose stimulation and and that really when I look back on it now it was uh, 50 years ago in the fall of 1966 so uh, don't look a year older <laughs> and uh, so so basically uh, 2016 is, is really most notable for the 30th anniversary of the discovery of preconditioning, but, but all this somehow brings us uh, here today. Um, the, the area of, um, at least um, the International Dose Response Society, was it's really the outgrowth of, of a very um, important area in toxicology and, and actually biomedical sciences was really wrestling with the shape of the dose response in the low dose zone and how do organisms respond to stress and are um, and that are actually motivated in, in part by and driven by regulatory understandings of dose response relationships and in the in the 1970s in this country and throughout the world it was really an environmental revolution in terms of regulation, trying to somehow uh, address exposures to, to carcinogens, address exposures to toxic substances, trying to come up with um, what are acceptable standards and uh, how, do, how do agents work? Do they act uh, via threshold phenomena? Do they act stochastically? Um, just what is going on here? And, and there uh, emerged from discussions, debates, and e developments of uh, precautionary principles that, that carcinogens would be regulated differently than, than non-carcinogens. Non-carcinogens, uh, and, and actually carcinogens were, were regulated to some extent throughout the early part of the 20th century via a threshold phenomenon. But then in the 1970s, um, the, the um, general consensus was that carcinogens should be treated differently and, and actually should be handled by a linear dose response relationship. This became the most contentious issue um, in, in environmental toxicology risk assessment and remains the most contentious, mostly because of economic reasons. And that is that when you come to what is acceptable level of risk and you come to levels of one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, that cleanup levels um, be, can become very expensive and this causes uh, those who are paying the bill uh, to push back. And, and, and there were many fights between, um, I'm going to call it big industry and, and uh, regulatory agencies over, well, do you think, do you, think you can actually uh, 
morph this, this uh, linear dose response into a, into a threshold. Uh, it would essentially um, increase um, the exposure standard and decrease the amount of cleanup and other regulatory expenses by, by really enormous amounts of money. And as it turns out, this was a, a tremendous battle, battle taking place in the now the late 70s, early 80s. And an industry would really challenge the capacity of the linear dose response to, to uh, explain data in the low dose zone. And, but since most studies were always conducted with very uh, few doses, you could never really distinguish a linear dose response from a threshold dose response. And because you couldn't really distinguish them, um, the, um, the, the regulatory response was to, was to be, um, take the more conservative and more protective route, which was uh, a linear dose response. And it was really out of that frustration that um, people in the radiation side of life took the lead, especially through the writings of uh, um, Dr. Lucky, um, who wrote a book in 1980, Ionizing Radiation and, and uh, Hormesis, in which he showed uh, in his writings that uh, many times uh, the linear dose response wasn't seen, but, but a kind of biphasic dose response, a hormetic type of dose response was observed. And, and this uh, resulted in a conference in 1985 in in California called Radiation Hormesis, which was really the first ever conference on this in the world. And, um, and so it resulted in, in um, a lot of people who had some interest in this coming together, trying to see what it all meant. Proceedings were published in two years later in Health Physics. Two years later, there was a debate in the journal Science involving uh, Leonard Sagan and Shelley Wolf uh, concerning was hormesis real or not. And that's kind of where I got um, Kind of, uh, I mean, the conference as well as the debate in science just sucked me right back in, and I haven't really let go of this since that particular time, trying to understand was this thing um, of hormesis real, not real. It went back to the early plant work of the 1960s, and, and ultimately led to a whole series of other meetings, um, some, a lot of grant funding to try to look at this, and the development of strong interest. And as it turns out, the biphasic dose response was found to be um, not an exception. It's found to be very common. It's found to have widespread gen generalization and began to generate um, a, a lot of uh, uh, interest, a lot of opposition, and um, it's a very contentious area. It remains a contentious area within the world of environmental health. Now, we created uh, a number of people in this room today and others created a society to take a look at this and to do it in a very um, as professional and objective way as possible. And um, somehow the, the years pass and, 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 and uh, the science evolves considerably on this. But uh, several years ago, it, it, it came to me that that one of the, the least contentious and most hopeful areas <laughs> in the world of adaptive responses was really the whole, whole issue of, of a preconditioning. And, that, and this was something that, that people could look at um, as a means of um, a positive for themselves, positive society. It's kind of outside the realm of uh, contentiousness that environmental regulations tend to wrap themselves around. And the, the idea was to um, take a look at um, how society and people, um, patients, could be benefited in an operational sense, in a translational sense, um, by the upregulation of adaptive responses, which we would call a hormetic dose response, uh, within the framework of preconditioning. And it was really within that framework that, uh, that, that this morphing of this annual meeting three years ago took place. And, and I would say that um, the first two years were very exciting, brought together people from the, especially from the neuro world and the cardiovascular world and others looking at uh, preconditioning, um, um, post-conditioning uh, and, and other aspects of this in really exciting sorts of ways. And so this today is our is uh, the beginning of the third such meeting on preconditioning. 
and its uh, role in, in medicine and its role in public health. And, and I just wanted you to have some sense as to um, how it came to be and why we're here today. And, and hopefully um, this uh, um, will prove to be very exciting for you. And I'd like to invite uh, uh, George to, uh, <laughs> to take over the, uh, the first session. So thank you very much.